Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak with you today. Um, the International Centre for Migration, Health and Development is a WHO collaborating centre and uh, we are a research, advocacy and policy organisation with a mandate to work on migration and health. Um, I prepared some slides but I think I'll actually just uh, speak to you. Um, so what I've been asked to speak on today, it's, it's not a new issue. There have long been concerns regarding the equilibrium between population size and the environment and the capacity of the world to um, feed everyone in the population. Uh, this was first enunciated by people like Malthus in the 19th century and then more recently by Sir John Beddington at Oxford um, in his term, uh, The Perfect Storm. Um, however, today, um, these fears about disequilibrium have not really materialised and population growth has always been compensated by an extraordinary advance in agricultural technology and in medicine. The Green Revolution in many parts of the world has managed to sustain growth and to avoid the massive excess mortality that people like Malthus had um, predicted. Um, so the population in 1800 was around 1 billion and today it rests at 7 billion, over 7 billion. Um, advancements like the Industrial Revolution, improvements in medicine and sanitation, and now the Technological Revolution has allowed more people to live longer, happier and healthier lives. And these changes have occurred in a very short time frame um, in terms of human history. Uh, but that's up till now, so what does the future hold? The UN has predicted that um, the world's population will reach 11 billion by the end of the century but that the rate of growth is slowing and experts currently believe that the world's population should stabilise at around this level. Um, indeed, population growth has already begun to slow um, with the incredible advancements um, that we've seen in access to family planning and female education and entrance into the work, um, work population in eradicating extreme poverty and in improving child survival rates so that there's no longer the need or at least the perceived need um, to have many children in order to compensate for the deaths of some. With these four um, what I would call essential components of um, family size reduction, the fertility rate has halved in the past 50 years and now rests at around 2.5. Um, and fertility is still trending downwards right now. Um, two children is the most common um, family structure in the majority of countries in the, in the world. And as my favourite statistician, Hans Rowling, um, would say, we've already reached peak child. Um, so the number of children is levelled off at 2 billion and it's likely that it will stay this way until the end of the century, or that's the predictions that we have at the, at the moment. Um, Cultural, economic and health shifts across the globe have led to these decreases in family size in conjunction with the um, expansion and the huge gains that have been made uh, in family planning. So the majority of uh, future population growth is currently expected um, to occur in Africa, um, in rural areas and in fragile states and among populations um, living in extreme poverty where for average fertility rates uh, still remain high. Um, contraceptive uptake um, remains low in some of these areas and systematic problems um, of drug supply um, have made access to family planning for many a persistent challenge which needs to be addressed. Um, I must note that however there's been, um, that this is not uniform and there's been many success stories already. Um, however and unless uh, the same changes um, in the four essential components um, take place um, here, as I've been seen in other regions, um, the predicted stabilisation of population growth is, is at risk. Um, so that's where our four essential components um, really do come in, and global commitment to these really must remain a priority. Um, so in terms of the uh, population environmental equilibrium, uh, many argue that um, areas in Africa where we're expected to see population growth um, are already food secure. How can they um, cope with more people? Uh, but economies are growing um, very rapidly and uh, food yield is a small proportion currently of what it could be with um, better agricultural technology and with expanded river irrigation. 
However, um, these advancements must come quickly if they are to outpace uh, population growth and ensure food security for all. So this um, really needs to remain high on the global, global agenda. Um, furthermore, we've already seen uh, measurable changes in climate change, uh, especially in areas prone to drought and desertification. Um, the human race is dramatically contributing to ch climate change, and therefore um, this population growth which in the short term at least is an ine inevitable. Um, this must be compensated by enhanced action, um, enhanced commitments to renewable energy and significant cuts to our carbon emissions across the globe. Um, one of the immediate effects of climate change that I would like to highlight is um, increased migration and especially climate change migration. Um, the United Nations currently estimates that one in 30 people are fit, fit the definition of migrants and um, over 60 million people are now displaced by conflict and natural disaster. So more people um, are now moving between health and ecological zones and many of them are women of reproductive age. Um, the gender gap in migration is de decreasing and forced migration in particular does affect uh, women. Uh, disproportionately. Um, refugees can be an especially difficult group to access with family planning and reproductive health interventions. Uh, even in well-structured refugee camps, uh, women's reproductive rights are often overlooked or overshadowed by immediate needs uh, such as food, shelter and hygiene, which are all extremely important, but we also need to um, include uh, reproductive rights and family planning in those immediate needs as well. Um, women affected by emergencies are also at increased risk of sexual and gender-based violence um, and of sexual exploitation, so they must remain a priority group um, that requires special attention uh, and protection in terms of their family planning and reproductive rights. Um, there are many, uh, as we've discussed, there are many barriers um, that migrants can face in terms of accessing health care. Um, legal barriers, economic, cultural, um, language barriers, and also uh, the knowledge of how to access uh, services, including health literacy. Um, uh, ICMHD uh, recently completed a, a survey of clandestine migrants in Geneva and their access uh, and perceptions of uh, reproductive care services. Uh, we found that almost a third of clandestine migrants were unaware of where they could go for pregnancy counselling um, and a similar proportion had never uh, visited a gynaecologist and also many didn't, were unable to name a hospital in Geneva and importantly many felt that um, health professionals didn't like them and did not want to spend time with them. Um, so it's issues like these that we really need to um, tackle if we're to improve access to family planning for migrant populations. Because um, indeed, they, migrants not only need to be aware of uh, contraception and their family planning um, needs, but they also need to be able to navigate the process of receiving these interventions in a healthcare system that they might not be familiar with or um, uh, really understand. Um, uh, the final point that I'd like to raise in terms of environmental dimensions of family planning is that of rapid urbanisation. Um, this has really become the, the age of the city. Uh, and in the first time in human history, um, over half the world's population is now living in urban areas. And this trend is expected to reach over 5 billion um, by the year 2030. So as the population has increased, it's become more urbanised almost in tandem, with uh, rural to urban migration uh, really being the driving force behind this. Um, urbanisation does come with many health benefits. Uh, we typically see... Um, higher rates of child survival and also longer life expectancies in cities, um, usually linked to both easier access to health services and to educational facilities. Um, however, health benefits are often not equally distributed uh, within cities. Uh, many urban centres, in many urban centres, growth has not been planned and large slum areas have developed, which um, uh, often are quite unsanitary and um, have poor health conditions. Um, it's clear that some cities have really been overwhelmed uh, by the rapid pace of uh, rural to urban migration. 
And so population distribution and migration management have now become two of the major challenges uh, facing the world. In terms of reproductive health, um, urban poverty and life in these slums are linked to high rates of unintentional pregnancy, high rates of HIV and STIs. Um, the risk of um, sexual gender-based viol violence um, is also significant in urban areas. Uh, for example, a UNFPA report from 2012 showed that in Tanzania, uh, urban girls, um, their, for their first uh, sexual experience, um, one in five, um, their sexual experience was forced. And HIV rates were double that of their peers uh, in the countryside. Um, this tra the, um, the sex trade is also mostly an urban phenomenon and accessing sex workers with family planning can be a challenge. Um, however, I'd like to highlight that uh, trafficked women are especially difficult to reach with care. Um, in Southeast Asia, right now, um, over 2, uh, 250,000 women are trafficked each year, uh, many of them from rural areas into cities. Um, a recent study in Thailand actually found that trafficked women were three times more likely to have unprotected sex and were three times more likely to have an abortion than non-trafficked um, sex workers. So fighting trafficking and in the meantime um, trying to access these women with reproductive care um, remains a global challenge that um, does need to be addressed. Um, Urbanisation does uh, provide many opportunities for family planning programmes, however, um, in cities knowledge of STIs and sexual health has been found to be um, generally higher and urban residents often are more likely to use condoms frequently. Um, they're, it's just easier to, um, they're more aware of advocacy campaigns, it's easier to reach more people in cities through advocacy campaigns um, than in rural areas. Um, and now we're actually faced by a different equilibrium, disequilibrium, um, namely that there's um, so many people for the available space. And with that, evidence has shown that as people move into cities, their fertility patterns change and they tend to have uh, fewer children. Um, there are, however, still strong disparities um, between the rich and poor areas. Um, and for example, in India, contraception use has been found to be far lower in slums. Um, and there's also been reports highlighting uh, the lack of contraception resources in particularly overcrowded areas and cities. Uh, so there is still work to be done. Um, and so in conclusion, I'd just like to say that as the population grows, as people become more mobile, um, and as our living environment becomes more urbanised, family planning programmes uh, must expand and must adapt to target those who are most in need. So thank you.